to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel the of christ spreading the soul-saving message of and jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in romans 4 verse 3 a great question is asked what does the Scripture say? We welcome you today to our Bible Questions and Answers series. This is the second lesson in our Bible Questions and Answers series, and we're so glad that you've joined us for this exciting study. We've got some really good questions that have been asked by uh, users of our website or those who listen to our program, and we're going to give a Bible answer to those questions today, and probably some of these questions you've even thought about yourself. And so we hope you'll stay tuned as we're going to look to God's word that has the answer to all questions. Our first Bible question that's been submitted for our lesson today is this. Someone writes, I recently heard someone say they needed to have their baby baptized because babies are born in sin. Does the Bible teach babies are born in sin? Well, friend, this is a very prevalent doctrine. It's a big part of Calvinism. Uh, in fact, the first, uh, first doctrine, well, the first and most well-known doctrines in Calvinism is total depravity. That is, when we come into this world, we are totally and completely depraved with sin. Sin is somehow built into our, our DNA, and we're born with it. We're born sinners, and we're destined to a sinner's hell. Well, friend, is that the picture? I know that's very popular, but is the picture the Bible paints a picture that says babies are born in sin? Friend, it absolutely is not. People do not need to baptize babies because babies are innocent and pure, and men and women, babies are not born into this world with sin. Now, how do we know that? Because the Bible clearly says there is a time before which a child knows to choose the evil and refuse the good. He doesn't have the ability to sin up to a certain point, which we often refer to as the age of accountability. Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 7. As he speaks about a child not knowing to choose the right and refuse the good, Isaiah says in Isaiah 7 verse 16, for before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, God goes on to prophesy, the land that you will dread will be forsaken by their kings. Friend, we learn from this there's a point in time when your child doesn't know what's right and wrong, doesn't have the ability to choose good and evil. But to even go back before that, I want you to clearly see that Jesus did not identify uh, children or babies or infants and toddlers as those who were totally depraved, but rather as being innocent, pure, and part of the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 18, as Jesus has some bring little children to Him, the disciples really don't think Jesus needs to be spending His time addressing little children or their parents, and so they kind of rebuke them. And watch what Jesus says in Matthew 18, verse number 3. Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. What is Jesus teaching there? That the kingdom of God is uh, full of a bunch of little depraved sinners running around? Well, of course not. Jesus is clearly teaching children are innocent. They're pure. They cannot have that knowledge of good and evil. They come into this world that way and is teaching the people who are listening, if you're going to be a part of the kingdom, you need to be innocent and pure like these little children. But friend, to go back even further, we want to illustrate from a couple of passages today that a person does not come into the world stained with sin, that you do not inherit sin from your parents, that men and women are born into this world perfect and upright, and it's because of individual choices 
that we make after the age of accountability that men and women sin. Let me give you a couple of examples. Open your Bible, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 28, and I want to share with you a passage about the king of Tyre. Uh, this man was not a godly man, but at one point, he could have been right with God because at one point he was pure. Ezekiel 28, verse number 12, this is a prophecy to the king of Tyre. God says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. And so the region of Tyre at that day had a king, and here's what God's message was to that king in that day. Now I want you to move ahead just a little in that prophecy to Ezekiel 28, verse number 15. Listen to what God says to this king. You were perfect, and don't miss this, you were perfect in your ways, watch this, from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. When this man was created, when he came to the world, how did God view that perfect? Not stained with sin, not having inherited the sin from Adam. That's not the idea. You were perfect in all your ways. When, God, from the day you were created, adverb of time, until, there shows a point in time in his life when he chose to sin, until iniquity was found in you. And so from this man's example, we see that he was made perfect, upright, pure, not sin-stained, as some would have us to believe today. And then there's a second passage in Ezekiel, that clearly shows men and women are not born, nor do we inherit the sin of our parents. Notice Ezekiel chapter 18, and there was a proverb in that day in the land of Israel. Here's what the proverb was. They said, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Basically, you ate some kind of sour candy and your children now taste it in their mouth, implying that people in inherit uh, the sins of their parents was the idea. And listen how strongly God spoke against that in Ezekiel 18 verse 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. What God say? You shall not, the righteous, will not, or the, 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 the one who sins, he's going to sin because, perish because of his own sin. The father shall not inherit, the son shall not inherit the sin of the father or even his righteousness. And so from this passage, we're clearly taught, I don't inherit somebody else's sin, nor do I inherit their righteousness. Those are individual choices that we all make. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Romans 14, 12, not of what Adam did. I'll give an account for myself. I don't inherit my father's sin or my father's righteousness. I make my own choices. And so, friend, as you think about this question, someone said, you know, we need to get our baby baptized because babies are born in sin. Friend, that's not the case at all. You don't find anywhere in the Bible where it teaches babies are stained with sin of Adam, that they have somehow inherited that sin. In fact, the passages we've looked at clearly show that is not the case. All right, let's turn then to another question in our Bible question and answer series. And as always, if you've got a question you'd like to submit, you can email us those questions at questions at thegospelofchrist.com or you can visit our website thegospelofchrist.com slash questions and you can fill out a form and send those to us. Here's the second question for today. Some people call their church by different names of men or different words or actions in the Bible. Does it matter what name we call the church? And so basically you find a lot of different names, some of them after great men that they think, or some after some religious act like baptism or something like unto that. Does it matter today what name we call the church? My friend, we need to realize that the Bible has specifically spoken on this subject and it does matter to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, the scripture says, do all, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, Colossians 3, verse 17. The Bible clearly says we're not to go beyond what is written, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 6. The scripture says we're not to add to or take away 
from the words written in the book. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. And so, friend, the Bible clearly says whatever we do, we need to stay within the boundaries of God's Word. And it does name, matter to God about names. Think about this. God changed Saul from Saul to Paul. Why do He do that if names don't matter? And, and we understand that names matter. Would you name your son Adolf or Hitler or, or Jezebel if you had a daughter? Would you name somebody today Judas? Well, no. Names carry a connotation and names are important to God. Now, think about it this way. Let's say that on the day that you and your wife were going to get married, she said, you know, your last name's kind of a funny name and I don't know if I can spell it. I think I'll take your best man's name. How would you feel about that? Well, you wouldn't like that. Why? Because names are important. They're significant. They share a connotation. They, they, show, uh, uh, they show connection is the idea. And so when we think about the names in the Bible, it does matter to God what name the church is called by because, and here's the real reason, because those names either bring honor to men and their ideas or to God and His Son who built the church. Let me illustrate. Acts 20 verse 28, the Bible says, Jesus purchased the church with His own blood. Who, who pray, paid the price for the church? Did Martin Luther pay the price for the church? Mm, did John Cal No, John Calvin didn't. Martin Luther didn't. Uh, John Wesley? No, John Wesley didn't. Some great act in the Bible? No, they didn't. Who paid the price for the church? Jesus purchased the church with His own blood. If Jesus paid the price with His own blood on Calvary, my friend, shouldn't the name it wear designate Him as the owner and the one who paid the price for it? Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ greet you. God established and built the church. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, No other foundation can any man lay except which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The Bible clearly teaches that Jesus built and established His church. Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's God's church. It's Christ's church. And any kind of name or designation that doesn't bring honor to God and to Christ, friend, that's a name that you don't find in the Bible. Think about it this way. I often ask people to consider this. Let's say that all we had was the Bible. And we took this Bible and we read it. And we said to ourselves, this is the Word of God. We believe it. We're going to do what it says. We're going to obey you know, the plan of salvation just as they did in the Bible. If we did that, and as Acts 2.47 says, the Lord added us to the church, and all we had was the Bible, what church would be, at, be added to? A friend, I, I thumb through my Bible, and I read my Bible, and I don't find Methodist, or Baptist, or Catholic, or Presbyterian, or not, I don't find any of that. If all we're going to do is follow the Bible, you can't have denominational names and titles today. Why? Very simply, they're not in the Bible. You just don't find those in Scripture. And so names do matter to God. Names matter to us. The Bible says we're not to go beyond what's written. And friend, let's make sure that the name of the church brings honor and glory to God and is actually found within the pages of the Bible. All right, a third question for us to consider today is a very popular one that we often hear as it relates to salvation and especially as an objection to baptism. Here's the question that's been submitted. The thief on the cross, the writer says, was saved without baptism. Please explain why you teach baptism is essential to salvation. Now friend, let's understand very clearly. Luke chapter 23, about verse 43 following, Jesus clearly said to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. And so there's no denying. Nobody's going to deny. We clearly believe and teach as the Scripture does that the thief on the cross was saved. But what about this part? The thief on the cross was saved without baptism. Now let's explain how this uh, kind of goes in, a, in, in the logical form that people put it in. The thief on the cross was never baptized. That'd be the first part of it. The thief on the cross was saved. Therefore, a person can be saved without baptism. Now, friend, we do not deny 
We clearly teach the thief was saved, but what about that very first part of the proposition? The thief on the cross was saved without baptism. If I said to you, prove that, which you would have to do to reach the logical conclusion, therefore men and women don't have to be baptized to be saved, if I said you prove from the scripture that the thief was never baptized, could you do that? You can look through the New Testament completely and you can never find anywhere that says the thief was never baptized. Now, someone says, well, wait a minute now. You can never find anywhere that says the thief was baptized. No denying that. But friend, listen real carefully. The statement, the thief on the cross was never baptized, is an assumption. People surmise that. They have this idea in their head. But you can't know one way or the other. Now, think through that for a second. If you can't know one way or the other if the thief was or was not baptized, the whole argument falls. You don't have a leg to stand on in that argument. You cannot use the argument, the thief was saved without baptism. We don't have to be baptized today because you can't prove it's an assumption. You can't prove it one way or the other. Do you want to put your faith in an assumption that you cannot prove? Secondly, as you think about the thief on the cross, consider this with me. Did the thief die under the Old Testament age or the New Testament age? Well, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 17, the law of Christ went into effect after his death. We've got the preaching of the gospel occurring in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus died, the first time the gospel is ever preached or heard by anybody in a reality sense. And so the thief died under the Old Testament. He's not an example of New Testament salvation. Uh, like unto David, like unto Noah, like unto Solomon, like unto other people you find, like unto Naaman, other people you find in the Old Testament. I'm not going to draw those examples up and say, well, this is how we need to be saved today under the New Covenant. No, that's not what the Bible says. And so the whole argument falls completely on its face because you cannot prove one way or the other if the thief was or was not saved, which is the major beginning of that argument. And then he was living under a different law system than we are today. And so I know a lot of people will say, well, the thief on the cross proves baptism is not essential to salvation. Friend, you cannot prove that from his example, and we've clearly shown that's an assumption. You can't prove one way or the other, and you have to. You have to prove the first proposition for that logical argument to be followed through with the inclusion, the conclusion, therefore, baptism is not essential to salvation. You cannot draw a therefore if you don't have all that's there. And friend, in that argument, you surely don't have all the information and cannot use that as an argument. All right, let's move to another question then. Another question for us to consider today, someone's, a writer submits this question. I often hear people say, they know when Christ will come. I've been studying my Bible and I can't find anything on when Christ is specifically going to come. Does the Bible teach when Christ is going to return. Now friend, there's no denying the Bible teaches Christ will return. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 18, He'll come with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and He will claim His own on that day. Jesus said in John 14 beginning in verses 1 through 4, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. There's the definitiveness of this. Yes, there's no denying Jesus is coming again. But when is He coming? Well, let's listen to the Lord's words on that. And it may surprise you as often as we hear people try to put a time and date on Christ's return. Listen to Matthew chapter 24, and I want you to notice what Jesus says in His own words about His return. Matthew 24, verse number 36. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. When's the, when's the world going to end? When's Christ going to come back? 
We know those two are uniquely tied together based on 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 10, and 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 12. And so when's Christ coming back? When's the world going to end? You know, we hear a lot of people say, I know when the world's going to end. I know when Christ is coming back. Friend, here's one thing I can guarantee you. Anybody who says, I know exactly June 3rd, 2025, the world's going to end, or June 5th, 2020, Christ is coming back. Anybody who says they know when the world's going to end or when Christ is going to come back, you can know this for sure. That person is a flat-out liar. They, they have not said what the Bible says because the Bible does not say that. No one knows the day nor the hour, Christ said, about his, the, the world coming to an end and the, uh, His return. We just don't know when that's going to be. And so, you know, you get these people who make these prophecies. We have all these ideas. We've been studying the 70 weeks of Daniel. We've been looking at Revelation. Wait a minute now. Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour. Instead of trying to figure out exactly when that date is, which you cannot, why not just be ready always? Isn't that what Jesus taught? Be ready always. Watch and pray. Pray without ceasing. Live in such a way that regardless of when Christ comes, I'm ready for that day. All right, final question that we'll consider today is such an interesting question as we think about Bible questions and answers. And again, if you've got a question, we will encourage you to submit that to us by email. You can email us at questions at thegospelofchrist.com or you can visit our website www.thegospelofchrist.com slash questions and you can fill out a form and we'll do our best to give a Bible answer to those questions. Here's the final question for today. A writer submits or a reader of our website submits, why do Catholic bishops not marry and teach that one must not be married to be a bishop when in 1 Timothy 3 following, 3 1 following, the Bible says they have to be married to be a bishop? Well, let's turn our attention to that very good question and let's consider this for a moment. Notice the words of 1 Timothy chapter 3 as Paul speaks about the qualifications of bishops. 1 Timothy 3 1 says this, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now here's the qualification. A bishop then must be blameless, uh-oh, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. And so the basic question is this, why is it the case that in the Catholic Church today they will say that their bishops and their priests and the men they call father, uh, they cannot marry? When, in, when you open the Bible in 1 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 3, the Bible says they must be married to be a bishop. Well friend, the reason is this, and it's very simple, and we don't say this to be unkind, but this is a stark contrast between the church of the Bible and the Catholic Church. Catholic Church says to be a bishop, cannot be married, you don't need to marry, and we know all the problems that have come from that with sexual molestation and all the things that have come because of that. And so Catholic Church says bishops, priests, things like that, don't need to marry. You open the Bible and it says a bishop then must be the husband of one wife. The two don't match up. Take God in His Word. Let God be true and every man a liar. Friend, of all the examples we might could draw up, this is one of the clearest to show. The Catholic Church has departed from the teaching of the New Testament. The Catholic Church is not the one church you read about in the Bible. And, 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 and friend, we encourage you to listen very carefully to this. If this is in stark contrast to what the Bible teaches and the Catholic Church is doing the exact opposite of what the Bible actually commands, and here's what we ask you to consider today. What else is the Catholic Church doing that is not found in the Bible? And friend, there are a whole host of things that are just not right that they do that are not found in the Bible. And friend, we don't say that to be mean or unkind. We don't say that to just blast the... That's not the idea. 
We say those things in love. We want men and women to be saved, to become a part of the one church, to be right with God and to live in such a way that, that one day they can inherit heaven, that heaven can be their home. But if the Bible says a bishop then must be the husband of wife and the Catholic church says they can't be married, you've got two that are diametrically opposed. And so let God and the Bible be true and every man in his doctrine a liar. And so today, we encourage you to check your Bible. Make sure and see if the things that you believe are right. And friend, if you've never become a Christian, more than anything, we'd love to help you with that today. If you believe Jesus is the Son of God, if you're willing to repent of sin in your life, if you would confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men and be immersed in water, you can be saved today. On that great day of Pentecost, Peter preached, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of our sins. We're glad that you've joined us today for our question and answer session and we hope that you'll join us next time as we're going to look to the Word of God for the answer to all questions. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.